Okay, uh, I think I'll go ahead and introduce the event. Um, you can hear me, right? Well, someone can hear me. <laughs> yes. Okay, that's my problem. Okay. Uh, um, yeah, so I welcome everyone to this PhD, PhD, PhD workshop. Sorry, PhD teach, PhD workshop. Um, my name is Jonathan Scarlett. I'm an assistant professor in computer science and mathematics and a uh, member of the IDS organization team. So just to say a few words about IDS, we're a interdisciplinary institute in NUS. Um, we have affiliates from many different departments, including computer science, maths, and ECE. Um, we also have partnerships with several agencies and in industries in Singapore. And some of our current teams and projects include the Grab NUS AI Lab and the AI and Healthcare Grand Challenge. Um, and yeah, so more, more relevant to this week, we have our PhD program, uh, which we've started since a few years ago. And uh, we've just since last year, we've started doing these workshops to have our PhD students uh, sort of share the knowledge that they've gathered in the first, typically first couple of years. Um, so yeah, we hope that these workshops can provide a good experience both for our students and the attendees. Our students can get a chance to uh, sort of explore their topic and get some experience in teaching. And of course, the attendees can perhaps uh, learn a lot of new things as well. Um, we also hope that these can perhaps help promote interactions between sort of various people around NUS having, having similar research interests. So yeah, uh, you won't hear much from me. Um, I'm just here to introduce. And for the rest of the day, it's basically all in the hands of Shen Li who's going to tell us about uh, deep generative modeling. Um, so yeah, I think now we have a decent number of attendees. I think we can go ahead. Yeah, shall we start now? Yeah, thanks. Okay. Um, okay, good morning, everybody. Welcome to this workshop. Uh, my name is Shen Li. Uh, I'm a second year PhD student. And my research interest is deep generative modeling with its application in computer vision. So today we are going to have a short tour on deep driving models from the perspective of divergence measures. Okay, um, firstly, we need to understand what deep driving models are. Um, so throughout the whole workshop, we use the following notations. Uh, we let X denote data such as images, text, or audio. And um, we let Y be the labels if available and say that the learnable parameters. So to understand deep generative models, we need to do this by comparison with discriminative models. In discriminative models, we try to model a conditional distribution P, uh, Y given X, right? where Y is labels and X is a data of any form. And um, so one of the example is a deep convolutional neural network. And uh, th this figure here uh, demonstrate a deep convolutional neural network that is trained on MNIST. So MNIST is an image data set, if you are not familiar with it, that contains 10 digits from zero to nine. And here we show the digit two, uh, which is uh, an of dimensionality 28 by 28. And it's a one channel image. And um, this convolutional neural networks take as input this such an image. And uh, after a few convolutions and max pulling, um, it maps this image to the label space from zero to nine. And uh, um, so this, the last layer, the last output of this, this whole model will show us a categorical distribution. Um, so uh, such as which uh, category it belongs to, uh, how much the probability that it belongs to one particular digit. And, and don't worry if you don't, if you are not familiar with this operations such as convolution and max pooling. These are just, uh, um, you can understand it as a, a few, you can understand as a kind of a mapping 
that match the one matrix to another or one tensor to another or one vector to another. Yeah. And okay, that's uh, deep geometry models. So um, on the other hand, we are looking at geometry models uh, where we try to model the, the joint distribution P, uh, P of X and Y or the marginals, uh, the marginal distribution P of X when labels are not available. This is typically the, uh, the so-called unsupervised learning where we don't have labels for, for each of the data. So typically uh, in most of cases, we don't have such, uh, we don't have access to labels, which is the, yeah, which is the most of cases we would encounter. Um, and the word deep here in the deep joint models as its name implies means a deep structure will be utilized. And um, so um, using a shallow networks is not enough. So we need to go deeper in order to improve the model co co compatibility. Okay. Um, so deep joint models have numerous applications in computer region. The most important one is data generation. Uh, we can see the state-of-the-art models can actually generate amazingly authentic images in a relatively high resolution. So what you are looking at are all fake images produced by software. So this is quite amazing that you couldn't even tell the difference um, which one is real and which one is fake. Those are all fake images. Okay. Um, another important application is image re super resolution. Um, so in, in image super resolution, we are given a low resolution input. So it's kind of blurry. And uh, we are asked to use some kind of model that can generate its corresponding high resolution image. So you see these two works can actually generate um, its corresponding high resolution image. Um, but this one seems inferior to this one. And then, and these two works are all uh, deterministic, which means that uh, given one low resolution input, you get only one uh, corresponding is corresponding uh, high resolution image, but actually uh, the very recent work called SR Flow shows that this is actually a U post problem, uh, which means that given one LR input, low resolution input, you uh, to to determine uh, its high resolution output is um, should not be one. Uh, there, sh there should not be one solution to it, right? So there, there should be multiple of it. And uh, so this work actually showed that you, you, in order to uh, do this point estimate, we need to do the distributional estimate. So there, and uh, uh, actually it's, uh, it's modeling the conditional distribution um, of, uh, a high resolution image given the low resolution image, which means you can draw multiple solution from this distribution and you got multiple solution to it. Yeah. So this is a one application in super resolution. And another important uh, uh, application is image image translation. And in image image translation, we are asked to generate images of all kinds of styles while preserving identity, especially in face recognition. In um, in, in the context of face faces, um, we want to change the attribute of a given identity without changing its actually identity, right? Um, so you can see that the state of art models can change the inputs in terms of the color of hair, the gender, aging, pale skin, and uh, in terms of um, uh, facial, facial expression. Yeah. 
yeah, and uh, it doesn't change the identity of the face. Um, and here I will show you um, one more interesting example on stale transfer, where you transfer the stale of the image using deep GRMP models and uh, without uh, changing the main content of it. Okay, hold on a second. Is there any questions? Can you hear this? based on things that are flying around. A large database of real world images. The big advance here is that we're able to synthesize images with a lot more diversity and more fidelity than we were able to do. I really think this technology is going to be great for images. Um, I think whether you can hear the voice. Yeah, okay, let's continue. It's quite amazing. Um, so that's style transfer. And, uh, and beyond computer vision, um, beyond computer vision, deep general models of often have a wide application in other fields, such as drug discovery. In drug discovery, we would like to generate different kinds of uh, drugs with desired property. Uh, finding such drug manually is quite laborious. So we, we want to resort to the drenching models that can automatically generate anything we like, as long as it, it has the desired property we need, yeah. So that will facilitate most of the uh, related research work. And uh, density estimation is another important promise that a deep generative model should deliver on. In, uh, in probability and, and statistics, uh, density estimation is a construction of an unobservable uh, underlying probability density function. So intuitively given a test sample, we are actually interested. So, so this is the text sam sample we are talking about, uh, denoted by X tilde. So we are interested in how much is, is, it is likely that this sample, this particular sample belongs to the training distribution. And we want to estimate the, the probability density of it. And this figure demonstrates that density estimation using kernel density estimation technique. So the blue line here 
<clears throat> is a true density, but we don't know exactly the the exact form of this true density. This is a completely unknown. And we, we can observe what we can observe here is the, the right lines, or the right lines representing the samples drawn from the true density. So that's only that's the only thing we can observe here. Okay, so the so the goal is to given these samples alone, we uh, we need to estimate estimate the model density that approximate the true density without even knowing it. Okay, and this figure actually show that using this kernel density estimation technique, you can estimate this uh, dash the line that's the curve that approximate this true density. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's all for the application of the generative models. And here we, uh, we will go through the technical part. Um, so recall that so we, we would like to formalize the overall objective of deep generative models. So the X will denote the data uh, of interest. And typically in here, we are interested in images generation or uh, the evaluation of its likelihood. So in most of the cases throughout this workshop, we will consider images as an example. And why do those labels if available? But most of, in most of the cases, we don't have such labels. And it's, it will be quite laborious to collect labels for each and every of images. So, and the theta here denotes uh, learnable parameters. Okay. And uh, mm, the situation is that given a bunch of samples alone, um, uh, which is X, and we assume that all the Xs are drawn from this uh, data distribution, which is unknown identically and independently. Okay. And generative models aim to learn a uh, parameterized uh, P theta of X that approximate the true but the unknown data distribution density. So, so that's our target. We want to find a parameterized uh, uh, model distribution that can approximate this true but the unknown data distribution as accurately as possible. And naturally, we need uh, um, inevitably we need to uh, we need a one metric that measures how this approximation is. Yeah, and uh, in statistics, this kind of metric is called uh, divergence measures. We denote it as d of p data p theta, or the other way around. Yeah, and sometimes they are equivalent. And sometimes. They are not. It depends on uh, what kind of divergence you use here. And uh, yeah, so so this divergence um, will will take as input two distributions. One is unknown, but the other one is parameterized. And this divergence will output will return us um, a scalar that measures how close your approximation is. And this metric can serve as a training, an indicator of your training progress. You can actually see um, how well your model is doing right now. And uh, this metric also serve as some definition of DGM. We'll further show that different choice of divergence will lead us to different kind of deep journey models. And uh, this this acts as a key to define your deep generative models. Okay. Um, so uh, so in statistics and information theory, uh, information geometry, divergence is a function which establishes the distance of one uh, probability distribution to the other. Like I said, is acts like a uh, some indicator that tell us how good your how close these two distributions are, and uh, 
and uh, technically uh, this divergence is a weaker notion than that of the distance. So recall that uh, uh, in mathematics, a distance or a metric uh, set of x uh, is a function that takes two elements from this set and now puts one non-negative real numbers that tell us how close these two elements are right, in this particular set. And, uh, and this metric has, all, has also to follow three axioms here. Uh, one is, uh, uh, the first uh, condition is that um, if the distance between any two points in this set equals to zero, uh, if and only if these two points are identical. Okay, and the second condition is uh, the, if the, dis uh, the distance between x and y uh, is equal to the distance between y to x. And the third condition is a triangle inequality um, where, we have a where we have a third point in this set. And the distance between x and y is smaller than or equal to the distance between x to the third point plus the distance uh, from y to the third point, okay? Yeah, that's what we just talked about. We have three points here. And uh, yeah, this, this shows the relationship and demonstrate the conditions you need to satisfy. Okay. And uh, uh, typically we are considering Euclidean distance, Euclidean space, but uh, there are also uh, many other interesting distance um, where you will see the the space is not a street, street. it can be curved. And then, but the definition here will hold true for all the cases, no matter what kind of topology you're dealing with, what kind of a space you are considering. Okay, and recall that the, the, the divergence here. So, so these are the definition, definitions for um, the distance or magic. Um, but we are now considering that wording. So recall that that wording is a weaker notion than that of distance. And in particular, like I just mentioned earlier on, the divergence need not to be symmetric uh, in the sense that the divergence from P to Q is not necessary to, to be equal to the distance from Q to P. And uh, it, it doesn't have to satisfy the triangle inequality. So that's the difference between divergence, um, but between uh, of divergence from the distance we just talked about. So formally, we will introduce the definition of divergence. So suppose S is the space of all probability distribution with common support. The divergence on this set S, this space S, is a function that takes two distributions from this, this space and output a scalar that satisfies the following two conditions. The first condition is that the divergence between any P and Q will always be non-negative. So which means this will be a good metric for us because it's always uh, positive or zero. So you can see how close these distributions are. And this, uh, this is well-defined. And the second condition is that the, uh, the divergence between P and Q will be equal to zero if and only if P equals to zero. Yeah, which means if you, if you regard P as the, uh, the parameterize the model distribution and Q is the data distribution, then which means this, um, this metric, this divergence tells us when it, when it goes to zero, this will be a good approximation to the, to, to the true by the unknown distribution, right? Um, so is there any questions? Just feel free to let me know. Uh, feel free to let me know if there's any question. 
Um, okay. Um, so if no, we continue with one example, which is called F divergence. Um, so this F divergence include a, a broad family of divergences. Um, so the formal definition of F divergence is that uh, this, this family of divergence are generated through a function f of u, which is convex on the on uh, the interval u larger than zero, and such that f of one will will always be equal to zero. Okay, and uh, then of f divergence is defined as follows. So the f divergence between any two distribution p and q is defined as the uh, integral. Uh, of p of x times f of uh, q, the ratio between q and p and dx. Okay, mm. so here we will take a look at um, a few examples. So this, the table list of multiple choices for the generator f of u as shown on the, on the right-hand side, you see we, if we, cho we choose different uh, uh, form different species form for this generator for this uh, f of u, and this will lead us to different kind of uh, <coughs> divergence as we show here. So, for example, if we take the form uh, f of u as u times the log of u, and then this will lead us to the well-known well KL divergence. Okay, and uh, um, likewise, if you choose. Uh, f of u has a, the, the negative log of u, then uh, this will give us uh, the reverse KL divergence, and so on and so forth. Now, later on, we will show that um, um, GAN is actually the, the well known genetic model GAN, if you ever heard of it, uh, is actually minimizing uh, divergence like this. And uh, uh, which means that this uh, the typical the specific form of the f of u will looks like this in this way, and uh, same thing goes with the Jason Shan and divergence. So the the main idea is that a different uh, generator will lead us to a different uh, KL divergence, and uh, yeah, mm. okay. So from a high level perspective, we have the taxonomy of uh, deep generative models. So we now know that every deep generative model is actually minimizing some divergence between P theta and P theta. And in, in this workshop, we aim to answer the following questions. Um, and what circumstance, uh, which means what kind of uh, choices you made for the divergence will a general DGM becomes a specific model, such as uh, the, the most uh, commonly used ones like GANs, ways, and normalizing flows. So at the end of the day, we will show that uh, different choice of uh, divergence lead to different uh, generative models. And uh, uh, we will fill in all the question marks um, at the end of this workshop. And uh, by then we will have a bigger picture of their relations and how they work in detail, okay? Um, yeah, so next we will talk about the, uh, the challenges of designing a deep learning models. The first challenge is, is that in most of cases we deal with a very high dimensional data. Um, especially images. Uh, let's say we deal with one of the simplest image data set, which is called MNIS, as we mentioned earlier on, whose resolution is 28 by 28. And this simply gives us 784 dimensions in total, not to mention any more complex image data set. So uh, in everyday life, what we would observe is uh, what we observe are images of higher, higher, much higher dimensionality than this, right? 
So a, a typical example of MNIST is 28 by 28. Um, and such a simple uh, image will make it really hard to analyze what is going on in the, in the data space. And uh, yeah, it, it will make it really hard for us to analyze the data distribution. And uh, we know that this is quite different from a lower dimensional space um, from toy data set where we can actually all visualize uh, everything we would like to see. Uh, so this, this is a typically a two, three dimensional space row. Uh, we can actually visualize uh, how, the, how the data, how each point are distributed. And uh, we can actually, um, actually manipulate uh, any point we like and uh, put it into the generative models and see what's going on. And, uh, uh, man manipulate its uh, latent and see what the observation will change accordingly, right? So this, this is quite easy. We can, um, we can visualize everything we would like to see, but things will be quite, quite different and extremely hard for us to analyze uh, the real world data set like images. Okay, um, another uh, difficulty, another challenge is, the, uh, is that high dimensional probability distribution can have counterintuitive effects. Um, and here we take a D dimensional unit Gaussian, for example. Let's say we have a high dimensional unit Gaussian and it's a probability density is defined in this way. Uh, it, it is totally defined by two statistics. One is mean direction, uh, the mean location, and the other one is a covariance matrix. These two statistics will totally define the uh, Gaussian distribution and the consideration. And uh, specifically, we consider the uh, special case where we have the mean location as zero and uh, the covariance matrix as the, the identity matrix, which gave us the unit Gaussian we are familiar with. And uh, one thing you don't know about this uh, distribution is that um, is that uh, uh, when we draw a large amount of data from this distribution, let's say we draw 100,000 samples from this unit Gaussian, and we will see quite surprisingly that almost all the data will reside within this thin annulus. This, this annulus is really thin, and this annulus radius is uh, happens to be the square root of d, where where d is the dimensionality of the uh, Gaussian distribution, and uh, um, and um, more than that, there's nothing either inside or outside this annulus. This is actually uh, an, an, an empty bowl here, and uh, this radius, uh, yeah, like I say, is the dimensionality of the space. Okay, and formally this counterintuitive from phenomena is characterized by this uh, Gaussian annulus theorem. This, this is so-called the Gaussian annulus theorem, which states that nearly all the probability of the spherical Gaussian with unit variance is concentrated in this thin annulus of with O of one at the radius squared of the D. You see that most of the samples will reside within this annulus. Okay, and uh, to verify this theorem, I uh, here uh, run, a, run a little ex experiment that can verify this Gaussian annulus theorem to ensure that you actually believe in this mathematical results. Um, so, like I said, we draw 100,000 Gaussian samples from this uh, unit Gaussian, and we plot the 
the distribution of its norm. So every sample we draw, we calculate its norm, its L2 norm, and we plot its, the distribution of the norm. So you, you see that the horizontal axis is the norm of the samples, and uh, the vertical axis denotes the occurrence of this particular happening. And um, so we see that when D equals one, which we, we learn from uh, the uh, middle school, uh, you typically consider one dimensional Gaussian and uh, you will understand it. You, you wouldn't take it very surprising, right? So most of samples will just lie around this origin. And uh, yeah, that's quite intuitive. And that's nothing surprising. And, but the thing is that when you go uh, to higher and higher dimensionality, you see that the mode of the norm, the mode of the distribution of the norm is actually moving towards right. And there will be um, more and more empty space uh, around the origin. See that when D equals to three, and four, and 64, uh, and 64, you see that uh, actually there's nothing around the origin. And uh, like we mentioned for the MNIST data set, we are considering 784 dimensionality. So, <clears throat> so you see the mode of this uh, distribution actually concentrated around the square root of square root of the D, which is the 28. So 28 is square root of 784, okay. So this is typically quite uh, counterintuitive. And uh, yeah, so even in the simplest case, we see the counterintuitive phenomenon, not to mention the more complex data distribution in high dimensional space. So typically we are dealing with such a high dimensional space and the result in the distribution we learn will be far more complex than this, than this unique Gaussian distribution. Okay, so here is just an example to demonstrate this point. These two challenges will make it hard for us to design a journey model. Yeah, so in brief summary, we are faced with two, uh, yeah, is there any questions? if I didn't make anything clear. No, okay. <clears throat> so in a brief summary, we are faced with two major difficulties in designing a deep journey, deep uh, journey sorry, model. Uh, questions are in the chat channel. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, why the word is useful as proposed opposed to listens? Um, because distance is actually measure the distance in between two points. But right now, what we are considering, what we are interested in is the probability density. It's not a it's not a simple point in the in the space, right? Do, do I make myself clear? So the object we are considering is different. And the distance is for the point and the divergence for distribution. The distribution is a, you can think of as a function of points that tell us how occurrence one point will occur. Yeah, so that's the first question. Second is, is mu equals zero. Uh, yes, uh, here we consider uh, to demonstrate this Gaussian annular theorem, we are considering mean, uh, zero mean location. Yeah. yeah, that's called a unit Gaussian. But you can actually, uh, so you can actually consider non-zero mean location and, uh, and this origin will, origin will be the mu you're, you're, take, you're taking, right? Yeah, it doesn't depend on uh, the absolute location of your 
the distribution you are choosing. But it's possible to preserve symmetry and triangular coin. If it is why break it. Uh, preserve symmetry. Uh, what do you mean preserve symmetry? So you want to have symmetry property for, for divergence? Is that what you are saying? Yeah, that, that can happen, yeah. It, so uh, a KL divergence is not symmetric, as you know. Um, but uh, there are other, yeah, there, uh, let me show you here in the slides. So the KL divergence is not actually symmetric. Uh, intuitively, when you take P, and you consider KL between P and Q, and you actually, and when you consider the reverse direction, you actually reverse the ratio between P and Q. And that's not symmetric. And some other divergences are symmetric strictly, like Jason Shannon divergence. You can see it from the form, right? So you, when you replace Q with P and Q, you reverse their position, you can obtain the same form for the function, for the uh, divergence equation. Uh, yeah, we will show later that um, the KL divergence allows for analytic form of for optimization. So this is the reason why we choose KL divergence for most of the cases. And this, this will allow us to optimize the model better, but there, there's a uh, some statistical flaw for, for such choice. And people actually argue against it. And they will use some other divergence, but those divergence are not analytic. So that provide, pr provide us another difficulty of optimizing over the learnable parameter. Yeah, so there's always pros and cons. So yeah, yeah, and okay. And uh, slide 19. Um, so which part you, you don't understand? And so slide 19 is about to demonstrate the, to verify the Gaussian analog theorem where we draw 100,000 100, Gaussian samples from the unit Gaussian and plot the distribution. Uh, yeah, and plot the distribution of the norm. <clears throat> and when d equals to one, uh, yeah, when d equals to one, you see uh, this will give us the unit univariate Gaussian, which we are we were familiar with even in the in the childhood, right? So you will see when you draw the distribution, you actually see that uh, most of the samples are quite intuitive. Yeah, it's quite intuitive where most of the samples are concentrated around the origin. That's what we observe. Uh, for the one dimensional case. And uh, that's quite intuitive. That, that doesn't surprise me, right? But when it goes to higher and higher dimensionality, you can actually um, see this, those um, amazing things happening. Yeah, is that clear? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and before this, I, I didn't know about this property and uh, neither most of the people. Yeah, that's uh, quite counterintuitive. You can actually verify uh, in your laptop. Yeah. But that's a fact, that's a mathematical fact. And, uh, yeah, this is magic. Okay, yeah. I think that's that's it for the questions so far. So in brief summary, <clears throat> in brief summary, we are facing two uh, challenges. Um, let me know if there's any more questions. Um, okay. Uh, 
there are two challenges. One is uh, the distribution can be extremely complex. And uh, the other one is that uh, uh, we are working, in most of the cases, we are working, we are dealing with high dimensional data. And yeah. And, uh, so the conclusion here is that working directly in the data space is extremely troublesome. So this is a, a data space we are considering, like we said, is, is really troublesome. And the, the distribution is intractable in high dimensional space. So to handle these challenges, so this will lead us to this, uh, the key idea of uh, deep generative models. We result to BageNet where we assume that each data, each observed data point X uh, has its corresponding unobserved latent source code Z that lies in the latent space. And this, the distribution of Z can be a tractable one, let's say Gaussian, and it can be lying in the very low dimensional space. And you see the advantage of this. So, uh, so this assumption will make, make our life easier, much easier actually. By exploiting the Bayesian net, we can make the intractable tractable. We call that the sampling and the inference are two functionality that a DGM should enable. We want to sample from the distribution, from, the, from your model, your model distribution. And on the other hand, we want to infer how likely uh, this given point belongs to the di training distribution, right? Uh, I will refresh your memory by showing these two previous slides. So this is the part of where we talk about the, uh, the inference. We actually are interested, given one test sample, we, we are interested in this probability density, how much likely it belongs to them. Um, also, okay, there's a question. Uh, intractable distribution means that um, you couldn't write the, the density of the form. The, the specific density function for it. So you see Gaussian, it has a trackable density. You can, you can actually write the, uh, the density, the PDF for it, right? The probability density function of it, like we talk about here. And in most of the cases, you, you don't have such a form for distribution. So that's what I mean by intractable distribution. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, so, uh, so in here we, we are interested in the inference. And on the other hand, uh, we want to generate authentic images uh, from um, the model we learn, right? So these are the two functionalities that uh, the generative model should enable. And, uh, and it's quite challenging. Um, so we resort to BageNet where we assume that uh, there's a latent space which has a very nice property for the density and as well as the low dimensionality. Okay. And then, yeah, here we have a question. Um, I missed the beginning. Okay, uh, yeah, uh, so the, the table here is to show that, uh, and right now we, we are talking about, we were talking about IF divergence, which is a typical divergence for, uh, for general divergence, it's a special case, but it's a broad family of divergence. And uh, here we talk about, uh, um, how to determine of F divergence. Recall that the F divergence is defined in this way. And it, it depends on what, what F you take, what the form of F you take. So this table will actually show uh, different kind of uh, F here will lead us to different F divergence. Is that clear? Yeah, okay, yeah. 
yeah, uh, back to where we were. Um, so by using this Bayesian net, this Bayesian, uh, I mean, this uh, Bayesian net, we can actually make things really easy. Sampling and inference become re really possible, right? You see that uh, uh, for sampling, we can draw, just draw a sample from this uh, trackable distribution because it's trackable. It has a specific form for the PDF, uh, which means we can draw any sample we like, any, uh, no matter how many you want, right? You can draw a sample from this and uh, you just map it to the data space. So you learn a mapping from Z to X and that will give us the resultant image or any high dimensional data, data point. And for inference is also possible. Um, this means, this is because that if we somehow have the invertible function, which means we can invert this forward mapping from X to Z, right? This dashed line so as the inversion of this mapping, uh, we can actually infer its latent code and we can evaluate its density. And uh, yeah, we can do anything we want through this Bayesian net. So you see the advantage of this design principle. So, so this idea will, we will use this idea throughout the whole workshop and we will see that the different uh, uh, models use different kind of mappings from, from Z to X or the other way around. And this will lead us to different models. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so do you mind we take a five minutes break if possible? And then we uh, start from, from GANs and other uh, likelihood based models. Okay. So we I see you at 10.
Okay, um, let's continue. Welcome back. Um, so in brief summary, we know that a DGM actually, uh, every DGM is minimizing some kind of divergence between P data and P data or the other way around. Um, so yeah, so, um, so now we are going to focus on one of the major branches, which we call the implicit models. The reason why we call it implicit model is because the design principle of such models is not actually derived from the objective itself, as we show later. But later on, we'll see that they are actually minimizing the JSD, uh, the Jason Shannon divergence, as I uh, show in the list in, in the table. <clears throat> Okay, um, yeah, let's go through the specific. Um, so the design principle of implicit models such as GANs are, is quite intuitive and uh, revolutionary. And this is the very first work that introduced the idea of the adversarial. And uh, as we show in this, in this figure for a vanilla GAN, uh, I'm pretty sure you guys are from very familiar with this. Um, we design a generator here uh, that takes a, a random noise typically drawn from a low dimensional space and opens a, a fake image or fake data point. And on the other hand, we have uh, a discriminator that in the meantime takes uh, real uh, images as input as well. And also the fake in image and, and uh, it asks you to tell the difference to distinguish which one is real and which one is fake. Okay. And um, yeah. So in this two player game, uh, the generator, as we show down below, which is denoted by G of Z, uh, here Z is the, the Gaussian noise we draw from the lower dimensional space. And uh, the generator aims to generate fake images as authentic as possible. And they try to approximate the real to fool this uh, discriminator. And uh, it's, it is the discrimi discriminator job to, uh, to try to make a distinction between the real and the fake. Okay, so you see these are uh, like a gambling game. Uh, this is this is a uh, adversarial two-player game. One tries to fool the other, and one the other one tries now to be fooled. Yeah, and uh, so formally from the discriminator's point of view, uh, it is a binary classification problem. If we tag labels for the real and the fake, uh, and then some labels for the fake, right? So when we tag labels. We treated this is of this one is uh, belongs to one class, one category, and the other one belongs to the other ca category. So we are dealing with only two classes here, two categories here, and uh, and uh, for most of the cases we tag one to the real images and zero to the fake. Okay, and then this discriminator try to. Uh, tell the difference between real and fake, which means uh, it uses some classification loss function like cross entropy between the ground truth and uh, the predicted uh, categorical distribution. So formally, uh, I think you guys must be familiar with this loss function since it, this is the, uh, like uh, the very basic knowledge for uh, machine learning classification. Yeah, so, so the last function for the binary classification problem looks like this way, right? Where Y is the label we assign to, the, to each corresponding samples. And the uh, Y hat is the, uh, the predicted uh, labels we have. That means the output of the, output of the, uh, the model. So specifically, we take the sigmoid function because it maps these uh, logics to the 
probability space. And this will give us a proper probability for one particular sample X, right? Okay, uh, so, so this is a loss function for the discriminator. And in, in, in the other, on the other hand, we recall that we are playing to player uh, adversarial game. So the, this uh, discriminator try to make a distinction between real and fake. But on the other hand, this generator try to fold this discriminator, right? So, um, so for, the, for G, it try to minimize this objective. And on the other hand, for D, it try to maximize the uh, uh, the log likelihood. So, so you see, this, this is where we have the adversarial uh, adversarial game. So it, these two uh, object objects are playing against each other. Okay. So this is a general. This is a loss function for the vanilla gun. So and later on. Um, right after this, the first work got published, there, are, there were many, uh, many, many more papers that try to make change to it, to make it better, because it, this is problematic. But here we just uh, address the basic one, and you can see other variations through the future readings. And I will show at the end of the day, okay? <clears throat> Yeah, so uh, here is the specific of the algorithm. So the algorithm is called a mini batch stochastic gradient descent training of GANs. And uh, uh, what we have to know is the number of the steps to apply to the discriminator because you actually uh, alternate between the discriminator and the generator during then the optimization of this this function, right? You you alternate the role, and um, so you have to specify how many steps you take for the discriminator and how many steps you take for the generator. So here, uh, people would use k equals to one, and so this is the least expensive option for the discriminator. And as for the generator, people just take one step for the generator. Yeah. So for, uh, we will go along this uh, algorithm. So for the number of training iterations, we take K steps uh, for, the, for the discriminator. And we take one step for the generator. And for each step taken for the discriminator, we draw a sample, a mini batch sample from the, uh, from the, these, the latent space, you see that this latent space is actually chosen to be a Gaussian or unit Gaussian. And we draw M noise samples, Z1 all the way up to Z, Zm and form a mini batch. And then we uh, draw from the um, data distribution, but this data distribution is uh, intractable, remember? And what we have is a, a bunch of uh, data, and we just uh, draw a uh, draw a few samples from this data set, and form a set containing x one all the way up to x n. So we have uh, right now we have m noise samples and uh, m positive samples, right? And then we feed this noise samples because they are just noise, and we will then feed it to the generator to have the fake images. So we apply G function to each of this ZI and we will obtain the resulting image called the G of ZI, right? And these are the fake images. And on the other hand, we have the real images. We take a gradient of the loss function of the dis discriminator loss function. And then we apply uh, the the very classic uh, gradient ascent uh, for the discriminator. And we take a case that where k equals to one, it's just one step. Now you can actually take uh, multiple steps here. Yeah. So it is well known that again, training gun is quite uh, unstable. So this uh, 
the determination of the number of steps you are, you are going to take for the discriminator or generator is quite heuristic. So there's no some principle uh, for us to use to choose this hyperparameter. So this will lead it to very unstable situation. So that's the that plagues the gun training all the time, and people try to uh, make it better, make it more stable uh, from this different perspective. There's a lot of variance to it. Okay, now here we just uh, introduced a very basic one. And after training this uh, uh, discriminator, we will uh, take a gradient for the generator. And, and we will sample um, another mini batch and that is uh, consists of M noise samples, Z1 all the, way up, all the way up to Zn from the prior distribution. And um, <laughs> we'll update the, the generator by descending because here we, this is other words, several process. We ascend for the uh, discriminator and descend for the generator. Yeah, and this, two optimization processes alternated throughout this whole training iterations. Yeah. Okay, there's a question here. Um, mode collapse, mm, okay. Um, I think it depends on what kind of gun you're using. Uh, which one are you using, may I ask? Hey, um, yeah, yeah, so basically I'm really new to uh, GANs and I just recently implemented a Wasserstein GAN. Oh, okay, oh, yeah. Wasserstein there. And uh, yeah, if I, uh, if my memory serves, I think Wasserstein GAN is using uh, K equals to five, right? Yeah, correct. Uh, yeah, so, so like I said, there's no uh, general principle for it. Uh, and it also depends on what kind of data set you're using. Yeah, it, it's data dependent and it's model dependent. So it's always hard to say, uh, yeah. Okay, then um, what uh, would be the steps you you take let's say to determine if it's data dependent or like the origin of the, the cause of the mode collapse okay um yeah and pe people always depends on trail and errors and people first try a few steps and see how this model behave how the generator and discriminator behave and the idea is that to, uh, the principle uh, for designing a model, for, for training such an unstable model is that uh, we don't want either side to preview. You see what I mean? So you don't want either side to be better than the other one. You always control them to be in an equal situation. That's the experience. So, so it will helps to help you to decide this uh, hyperparameter. So if you train a few steps, you see the discriminator becomes the, uh, better than the generator, then you just uh, try to lower this hyperparameter. Okay, so how, um, so you will increase the K to increase the discriminator's uh, power? No, could you say that again? Uh, I don't follow. So, so you, in, for instance, uh, tuning K, you will increase K to increase the discriminator's power. Oh yeah, yeah. right. Okay. Because you updated more more than you do for the generator. Okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's quite tricky, and. Um, so the second question, so for each iteration you train is more than real samples. Um, I think they are equal, right? So they are all M samples, right? So 
And uh, the third question is what the meaning of the second reading is in? Oh, the meaning, uh, remember that we, so this is the objective we are using here. We minimize the objective with regard to the generator and maximize this objective with regard to discriminator, right? So for the discriminator, we want to maximize it. That's why we take a gradient ascent, ascending it the gradient that will lead us to higher and higher value of the loss function. And for the generator, we want to minimize this loss function. So we take a gradient descent. Yeah, by descending with the stochastic gradient. That's why we have the second gradient descent. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. So shall we continue? <clears throat> Uh, so remember that we, uh, yeah, um, let me see, where were we? Um, yeah, so remember that we, we need to answer this question. So that's the, uh, the story we are telling here. Uh, we want to show what kind of divergence is actually minimizing that. Remember that we call it an implicit model because it, the principal design, the starting point of designing such a model is not based on the choice of the divergence here, but uh, it does for the rest of the models. But for GANS, it doesn't. And it starts from the, this two player adversarial game, right? So we need to, we, but we still have to answer the question, what, what kind of divergence is actually minimizing? Yeah, so we must, show take a look at a few theoretical results and we will understand uh, what is actually minimizing so the first uh, um pro pro proposition the first uh, theoretical result is the proposition one which says that uh, for fixed g um, that means you you first fix the generator and you find them the optimal discriminator d right so it shows that uh, when you fix the generator, the optimal discriminator is given by the ratio between the p data and the, and the, the p data plus pg. Yeah, pg is the model distribution you learn. You can understand pg as p theta. Okay, it's a learnable, it's a model distribution, it's a parameterized model distribution, but p data is the unknown distribution. So it shows that the discriminator is actually uh, is a the, the d star is the ratio between them. This is quite intuitive, right? Because uh, th this actually accounts for how many, how much this uh, p data accounts for the overall uh, summation of this two density, right? So, um, yeah. And to show this, we, we first, uh, because g is fixed, Remember, we have this uh, optimization function. And because G is fixed, we take a G as a constant. And we, the only thing we have to, uh, to consider is to maximize over D. So D here is the only uh, variable that affects this quantity, right? So, yeah. So, um, Okay, so um, so VG, recall that VG is written in this way. Sorry, VG is the uh, optimization objective. And uh, yeah, so specifically we can write it into the, the integral uh, over the, uh, the integral of the P data log of DX plus pz log of one minus d of g of z, right? So you, you can compare these cool, these two quantities. And right? well, here we just apply the definition of the uh, expi expectation by writing it into in the integral form. Okay. Uh, what do you mean by px is the fraction of image equal to x in the data? 
mm, px. There's no px here. The p data, do you mean p data? p data of x. Yeah, yeah. P data of x is a um, p data of x is the uh, probability density, the true probability density given the sample x. I didn't mean it's a fraction of the image is equal to x. Uh, I think what you mean here is a probability, not probability density. So th this is a quite different. So p data is not the trackable, is is the intractable distribution. We don't know the, remember, we don't know the form. Yeah, this is just a theoretical justification. This is just a theoretical treatment. We are not doing any calculation here. It just to show that the discriminant, the best discriminator we, we would have is, uh, can be written in this form. And but this is not what we know here. Yeah. Okay, back to the uh, the proof. We just write the expectation into the integral form, and we can further show that by change of variable formula. Uh, it doesn't matter if you are not familiar with it, right? but anyway, it can be written in the, into this. You see that here, here you considering the density in the latent space, and now you're considering the data in the model uh, distribution space. So this is a change of variable form. I'm pretty sure you learn from calculus, and this is a basic knowledge. So you wouldn't be surprised at it. So um, so it, anyway, it can be written in, in this whole integral, okay? And remember that uh, G is fixed and uh, we now try to find the best D that uh, will maximize this quantity. So what will, what will we do? We just take a gradient over D, right? Take a gradient over D and we set it to zero and find the uh, optimum for D. So after a few uh, calculations, you will show that D can, the D star can be found in this way. Yeah. So if D can, this can be, the optimal D can be written in this way, we can just plug it back to the quantity, which is called the CG. Uh, and here we have a question. To make sure I understand how this is in the image. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. You can understand the X as a, a generalization of matrix because we, uh, most of the cases we are dealing with uh, RGB uh, images, which we have uh, where we have three channels for uh, each channel, uh, we are three channels for one image, right? So it's not a one matrix. It's now you have three matrices concatenated together. So this is a generalization of a matrix, which, which is called a tensor. So you can regard it as a three-dimensional tensor. It has a three rank. Uh, one is a horizontal, one is a vertical, and the other one is channel. Yeah, that's called a three-dimensional um, tensor here. Yeah. So back to the proof. And so remember that all, all we have is a G, G because you first fix G and you find the optimal D. And now you find the optimal D, uh, the, the, the rest of the variable is only G here, right? So this will be a function of G when you plug the D star back to the quantity. And uh, you will, after a few simplification, you will get a form like this. So this is quite nice. You see that so this, uh, you, you first uh, take expectation over the, the two data distribution and uh, the, the one in the bracket is the log, be, log of the ratio between P data and the summation. And now you, the other term is that you draw a sample from the model distribution you learn and you, you consider the log of a PG over the summation. It's quite a symmetric and quite nice. Okay. The reason why we derive this 
C of G uh, can be shown further in the final result, final theoretical result. After this theoretical result, we will see, we'll answer this question, what kind of divergence is kind of minimizing, okay? So after obtaining the CG, uh, recall that the CG can be written in this way, we divide, divide the numerator by two and divide the uh, de denominator by two as well. We do the same thing for the second term. You see that this, this doesn't change the equation here, right? And then, and then we take the division by two out, out of this bracket because this, this is a log. And this will be a minus log of two. And here it will lead another log of minus two. And then we will have a lo minus log of four, right? And it doesn't change for the this uh, denominator. Okay, so the, so the negative log of four will put it in front. And now we recognize it as a, Recall that the KL divergence shown in this table mm, here mm, is written in this way. The divergence between P and Q is, can be written into an uh, integral P of X log of P divided by Q, okay? So we recognize the term, this term here <coughs> as a KL divergence between P data and the the, uh, the uh, summation divided by two, right? Is that clear? I think it's very clear, right? And uh, the second term is a reverse one where we have PG and uh, the summation divided by two. And further, we recognize these two terms as a uh, shannon divergence. We call that in the table, the Jensen shannon divergence can be written in this way. Okay, so now here we have a one over two on the outside. And then now, uh, yeah, we recognize as a two times the Jensen shannon divergence. Yeah, so, so right now you can see that um, the global minimum of the uh, tuning criterion C of G is achieved even only if PG equals to P data. And the minimum achieved the value minus log of four. Remember that the uh, divergence, any divergence is uh, larger than or equal to zero. So the best case we can have is that the PG, PG approximate P data. When we have this situation, well, we will have the zero session shannon divergence. So the only thing that left behind is minus uh, log of four, right? So this is the, the best value we can have for C of G. Okay. Yeah, we have a question here. Determine the Q distribution. So the mean between Q here, uh, U mean in the table. Hold on a second. What do you mean here? Uh, this Q. Uh, yeah, this Q here is, is now what we are considering just in, in the general case. Oh, you mean, uh, okay, I see. Yeah, it can be seen as a mean between two distributions. It's a, yeah, you can understand that way. But this kind of understanding doesn't lead you to anywhere. Right, yeah. So this is just a mathematical treatment. And, and finally, um, yeah, actually it leads you somewhere because uh, um, writing so far until the last line, you have a two KL divergence between P data and uh, this nothing, right? And the PG and this nothing. And uh, you, you don't interpret at this point. 
but further step will lead you somewhere because you recognize this as a junction shunning divergence. And right about now, you you don't have this mean, this so-called mean distribution anymore, right? So this junction shunning divergence is defined in this way. So you have a P data and PG. Yeah, so it, it's okay when you write it till here, but you don't stop here. Is that clear? Yeah. Okay. Mm. Yeah, so, so the first achievement we have for today is that we, right now we can say that this is pretty clear to everybody that uh, uh, this gun is this implicit model is actually minimizing the adjacent shunning divergence between P data and P data, P theta. And since the this divergence is symmetric, you can actually write in the opposite way, uh, which is a adjacent shunning divergence between P theta and P data. So because it's symmetric, so it's fine to write in this way. Okay. And um, yeah. And here we will uh, take a look at its impl implementation. Yeah, I will show you uh, one implementation I have for GANs, the very, very basic version of GANs. So it involves only one, uh, you can see this, this uh, involves only one file, one training file. So we first take a look at uh, how we define a generator. The generator, I will use a PyTorch uh, um, to implement this model. So I'm, I'm sure you guys must be familiar with Python and PyTorch. I assume this. Yeah. <clears throat> so, so from line 38 to line uh, 61 is the implementation for generator where we inherit the NN module. And uh, here we have this uh, contract constructor for the generator. And we see that we first define some block. So this block involves a layer. The first layer is a linear layer where you have to specify the in dimension and, and the out dimension. You see what I mean? The, the input dimension and the out, output dimension. And, and the normalized uh, is always side to true which means that you, you incorporate the batch norm BN layer, okay? And then you apply the nonlinearity activation, which is a leaky relu. Yeah, that forms a block, and we will keep using this block to construct the, the overall generator, okay? And for the, for the main model, we will have uh, the block uh, the first block that uh, specifies uh, the input dimension as the latent dimension. Recall that the GAN is uh, taking some noise in the latent dimension. Uh, so you have to specify the latent dimensionality. So in most of the cases, we will use, uh, let me see, 100 as the dimensionality of the latent space. So this is the first block will maps the latent space, space to the uh, higher space, which is 128. So specifically it will apply, first apply a linear transformation and then a BN layer and then a leaky relu. Okay. And the second block 128 to, 100, uh, to 256. And you can see that the, it is increasing the dimensionality because we are working with the lower latent space and uh, we want to have a, and uh, the image you are working, uh, you are dealing with is actually lying in 124, such a high dimension. So that requires you to design model that maps the lower dimensional space to a higher dimensional space. That's the reason why we have a progressively increasing dimensionality throughout the whole transformation. And uh, in the end, we <clears throat> we have a, oh, uh, why do we have, 
Oh, let me see. Um, let me first show you results. So yeah, you can actually use the convolution layer, but here I just uh, play, uh, show you, uh, show you the very, um, very basic implementation where we use a linear transformation. And we will show that this is a sufficient model, uh, simple image. Yeah, you can actually use a convolution layer and hopefully this will give you a better result. Yeah, and you can use anything you want. Yeah, so uh, after a few blocks, we will have a linear transformation that transform uh, 1024 up to the image shape, the original data space. And we apply Tash at the end so that every pixel will lies within the interval from minus one to one, okay? And the forward uh, operation will take a Z, the draw from the latent space, draw from, let's say, Gaussian space, and uh, this model will map it to the image space and you reshape it to the desired shape. Um, yeah, I think it's uh, 28 by 28. And then you return it. Uh, the value for the, yeah, like I said before, the value is 100 for the latent dimensionality. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, that's clear for the <clears throat> generator. And for the discriminator, it do the opposite. It takes uh, the dimensionality of the image and then map it to the, using the linear layer, then map it to the uh, 512, and then apply leaky renew and then linear, leaky renew, linear, and then schemoid. Because we want to have a probability to, that tell us how much likely this image uh, belongs to the, the real one set, the real set, right? So now the forward operation will take the image, and uh, uh, right now you can see why we have linear because, uh, because here I flatten it. And you see that I, I view, I reshape the image into a flat one and then put a flat, that means we I vectorize it and reshape it to a vector and then put it into the model. And this model will treat every image as a vector instead of a, a tensor, a matrix. So that's why I don't use a convolution here. Yeah. But you, using convolution will, will be better, I assume. So this, uh, <clears throat> so at the end, this model will output the validity, which means uh, uh, how much likely this image looks like a real one. So, so far we have designed the structure of one generator and discriminator. And then we will define a loss function. The loss function is, a, is actually the binary, binary classification loss. And then we instantiate the generator and discriminator and put it onto the CUDA and the loss, so, so uh, as well as the adversarial loss. And here I, I made a, folder for the, um, to, to save the results. And then here we apply this amnist. So, so this is the model we, this is the data set we are using. So what we want to generate an amnist like model uh, images. And the, the train is set to true because we use training set and download the true and uh, Transform, uh, regarding transform, we first resize it to the desired image size, and then we apply the two tensor that, which uh, project uh, every pixel into the interval from zero to one. Yeah. And then we normalize it by, by dividing uh, 0 0.5 and uh, by, by subtracting it from 0 0.5 and uh, dividing by zero. 0.5. And the batch size we use is, uh, let me see, is 64, which is a typical setting for most of the model. 
<clears throat> this is uh, not a large by size. <clears throat> and we shuffle the, the data set every time uh, for different apples. And we apply different optimizer, optimizer for different models, generator and uh, discriminator respectively. Uh, we apply different uh, learning rate. Uh, actually, they are the same. Uh, the value we pick for the learning rate is this. Yeah, and uh, <clears throat> yeah. Mm. So so here goes the training, the whole training epochs. For every epoch, we and for every iteration, we uh, we take a batch, we draw a mini batch from the data set, and the valid is the uh, ground truth. Uh, here we. Valid means real. We we fill fill it with one point zero. Uh, remember that we take one point zero to the real label to the real uh, image label and zero to the fake image label. And um, so this is an image we draw from the data set, and we put it as a tensor. So this will be of shape uh, 64 because of we the batch size we're using 64. And this will be one by 28 by 28 because we are working with a uh, amnist data set. <clears throat> yeah, and the, the optimizer, uh, the zero, zero grad of the optimizer is set to zero and uh, and the next thing we do is uh, we draw a sample from the normal distribution. So this is a noise uh, from, you know, remember that the latent dimensionality we choose is 100. So this Z will be of shape um, 64 by 100, right? And then we put it into the generator and this, this will give us the output. Why do we use the real image when you initialize? Um, so, so these are not quite related to one another. Okay, and this is where we use, we tag labels, and this is where we uh, draw samples from the data set. They are not kind of related. There's no relation to it. Uh, I'm not sure whether you ask this question. Okay, just to separate the procedure here. Okay. And this generator will map this uh, latency to 64 by 1 by 28 by 28, which is the same as this line. So this is the real image. And now this is a generated image, which is also called the fake images. And now you, you put the fake images into the discriminator and with the positive, uh, with the valid labels, you must be very confused because, right? Are you confused? Um, yeah, because now you, you want to, uh, because of, PyTorch is actually minimizing. And so every function you you try to meet, you try to optimize, you actually minimize it. You, you don't maximize it. So that's why we do the opposite here. We want to maximize this quantity, but uh, due to the implementation, we have to do the opposite. We reverse the role of each other. You see what I mean? So now we tag the positive label to the fake image and take the gradient descent instead of a gradient ascent. So this G loss will be for the backward and the optimizer take a step. And now we, we, so this is the part of where we train the generator and now we train the discriminator. So uh, as always, we take a zero grad here and then the null discriminator has taken two, uh, two cases. The first case is a 
for the real images. So where we tag the real images with the valid, with the real example, the, the one uh, as the field value, right? And on the other hand, it takes the fake images with the fake labels here and try to minimize the loss function, real loss and fake loss. And we sum it up, divide it by two, and take the gradient, update the parameter. Yeah, and uh, that's all. And we keep doing this until convergence. And uh, uh, here I show every epoch I, I plot the uh, resultant image we can generate. And you can see this. So at the, at the beginning, you will see, uh, so every patch is a, is a whole image we generate. And we, here we show five by five, 25 images we generate at the end of every epoch, okay? And then now you, you see at the beginning, it's quite noisy. It's nothing like the real image. And as you go further, after only 400 iteration, you can see it uh, looks like ones, right? And now you go further and further. You see, it's quite amazing, right? So refine itself. <clears throat> Yeah, but it's still noisy. You see there's a dots, white dots around the number. And it becomes a more and more diverse. That means the model actually learning something. Sorry. Yeah. And as you go further and further, you see that it become cleaner and cleaner. And there's no more points, no more noisy points around the digits. Yeah, and it becomes more and more diverse as the training proceeds. Okay, at the end, you will obtain the optimal one, which is quite nice. Yeah. Mm. Okay, and uh, that's all for dance. So, uh, in a brief summary, we have introduced uh, the design principle of dance and uh, and also, the, more importantly, we answer the question, uh, what's the kind of divergence is that it, it is minimizing, right? So in conclusion, it's minimizing the JS divergence. And then we show the one basic implementation that generates a fairly good results. So the question here, uh, could you explain why I do the... Oh, the mesh equilibrium. Um, I'm not an expert to this. Uh, I see a lot of paper that is say something like this. Uh, there, there must be a theory is beyond computer, uh, beyond the machine learning community. This not theory is about uh, uh, what, what would you call it? Um, gambling theory. And uh, I'm not an expert to this. Yeah. So anyway, you can see that this. Uh, it, it was kind of uh, divergent is minimizing, and that's the best I can do. Yeah, and can you explain what the sh in channel divergence? Uh, right, channel divergence. Yeah, I, I know what, what you mean, but I think this, this is beyond me. So channel divergence intuitively is uh, like uh, most of the divergence in minimizing the two, uh, two, two distributions. And it's also more importantly, it's uh, symmetric, and, um, not like a uh, KL divergence. Yeah, and uh, let me see. Uh, Uh, 
Oh, what, what do you mean middle model? Mm. Mm. Oh, right. there are so many never use. But uh, what I can say here is that uh, Jason Shannon divergence is kind of uh, problematic as well because uh, in Walter Stan paper, you, uh, the, the author actually analyzed the, the problematic uh, perspective of the Jason Shannon divergence. In high dimensional space, the, the probability that the two divergence, two uh, density overlaps is nearly zero. So it's hard for the model to learn, actually learn something. So then people will use a water stand divergence instead of a Jason Shannon divergence. Yeah, and the uh, water stand divergence is also symmetric. So it's better than this. And uh, I don't see any advantage of uh, understanding it because it's not the best one. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry, it was disconnected. I share my screen again. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Can you see this? Um, so back to back to the question. Uh, right. Uh, I don't know how to answer this. Uh, I don't know what is actually doing. So you can actually maybe you can uh, play some toy data sets and see like like what we talk about here we deal with low dimensional data set and we see how one distribution is approximating the other and you will see through the iterations how it behaves uh, yeah that will helps that will help you understand it but actually things are quite different when you go to the high dimensional space and the the conclusion you draw from the lower dimensional space does not apply to high dimensional space in most of the cases. And people are quite confused as well. Yeah, that's a major difficulty, like we said before. Um, because I, I think it's because of the human's uh, limit. We can't perceive any high dimensional signals. Yeah. Okay, and uh, I think we, we have to take a break and uh, we'll see you at uh, 10.5, is that okay? And then we will continue with the discussion with the rest of the models, um, like a, which is a broad family of models called the uh, likelihood-based models. And we will answer those question marks one by one. Seem to be a difference between the uh, and the lines between yeah. So we want to define a new distribution. The difference between mm, yeah, sort of yeah, yeah. Let me think about it during this break. Yeah, see you later.
Okay, everyone's here. Yeah, let's continue. Mm. So, uh, so that's gone uh, Siri. And um, yeah, the next thing we will look at is an, another family of the deep geometry models, which is called likelihood-based models. Okay. And this is a, a broad family of geometry models, which, which include a lot of uh, well-known models, such as uh, variational encoders, uh, flow-based models and uh, energy-based models and uh, diffusion-based models. And you, you must you must have heard of this uh, VAE and uh, the rest of them are not quite, uh, doesn't sound familiar to you. And uh, we'll go uh, over the preliminaries. And so to understand likelihood-based models, we have to understand a few quantities here. So recall that the X denotes the observable variable, that's the data you can see in your data set, but you don't know P of X, right? The, the real one, P of X. And uh, Z is a latent to be inferred. Is uh, we assume that uh, each X, because we, we are using the Bayesian net, uh, we assume that each data point here has one or more latents to be inferred. And we don't know exactly what they, what they are, but we try to infer them. So, um, so that's why we have this posterior. So posterior is, is actually P of Z equals X. What it really means is that uh, after you observe the data, you will have a new, some new, better understanding of the latents you assume, right? Because you you get you are gathering more information from the data set that will bring some new knowledge to you about the, the latent space. So that's called a posterior. And in contrast, we have a prior, which doesn't give you anything about the data. So this means that when you, what do you know about the latent when you don't have data at all, right? Is that clear? So that's the prior, you, prior knowledge you have about the data set. You have a, a broad estimate, a very crude estimate uh, about the latents. And after observe, observation, after observing a few bunch of data, you will have uh, some new knowledge about this state, uh, about this uh, latency. Yeah, that's the difference between prior and posterior. And uh, how to connect them? To connect them, we uh, the Bayes rule tell us this is equal to the conditional likelihood times the prior divided by this marginal likelihood. So uh, we'll go through these quantities uh, one by one. So the first thing is that uh, what, what is the conditional likelihood? Conditional likelihood means that um, um, this is actually conditional, right? So it, it must condition or something. So the thing we condition is, uh, is Z, uh, the latent. And after observing, after we have the latent, how much likely we have a normal data? Do you see what I mean? So this is telling you how much likely this, this X will looks like a regular data point in the data set when you have obtained Z here. So that's called a likelihood, conditional likelihood. And in the denominator, we have the marginal likelihood. The reason why we call it marginal because it's, it's marginalized over Z. So it doesn't, Z doesn't appear anymore. So all we have is X, which is also called evidence. And from uh, probability theory, um, from probability theory, we know that P of X is equal to the integral uh, of 
the conditional likelihood times the prior. And this integral will be quite intractable in most of the cases. You don't have an analytic form to show it. So this will bring us um, much of the difficulty in designing a, such a model. Yeah. And this Z typically uh, still lies in this high dimensional latent space. So, so it's hard to compute this term like this. Okay. Um, so here we also have to understand another important equivalence, uh, which is a, uh, which is that minimizing the KL divergence is, is actually equivalent to maximizing the marginal likelihood. So we will prove, uh, go through this simple proof, we'll understand why we have the, the well known. MLE. So in statistic class, you are told that you take a, uh, whenever you try to estimate some parameters given a bunch of estimation, uh, give a bunch of observation, you, you perform ML, MLE uh, estimate, right? But you have no idea why you do that. So this equivalence will show you uh, you're actually minimizing the KL divergence between P data and P theta, and that, that will lead you to the MLE. So by definition, we know that uh, the KL divergence between P data and P theta can be written in this integral, and this log will uh, can be written in two, two terms. One is a log of P data, and the other one is log of P theta. And we all became two terms here, right? Is that clear? And um, because we are minimizing the, the loss function, the loss function over the learnable parameter, and we observe that in this, the first term is a constant with regard to theta, because you have no uh, theta involved in this in the first term, but you have uh, some, you have theta for the second. So what you re, what, what it remains is the second term, and you see that we minimize the second term, uh, which is equivalent to maximize the this integral, right? Because we have the minus sign here. So in conclusion, the the optimal say the star is the argument of the minimization of the KL divergence which is equivalent to the argument, the maximization of the expectation of the log of the model distribution. Now you see you retrieve this MLE objective that you, you maximize this, uh, this expectation and you take a gradient over, uh, you take a gradient with regard to theta, you set it to zero and then you obtain the, the optimal one. Is there any question? Okay. <clears throat> so in comparison with guns, we, we know that the likelihood based model is actually uh, minimizing the KL divergence between P theta and P theta, P theta. And in the meantime, it's, this is equivalent to my MLE. Um, but uh, in GANS, like we just discussed, it's uh, minimizing the JS channel divergence playing a two player game. Okay, so this is a difference. So now you can see that we fill in the question mark by saying that uh, this is actually uh, whenever you take the divergence as a KL divergence, this DGM will lead us to likelihood based models. Yeah, and uh, so different branch of the likelihood that were uh, likelihood based models lead us to different specific uh, implementation of likelihood based models. So uh, because of this term is quite intractable, and we will encounter different treatment for this term, and this will lead us to different models. We just see here, including VAE flow, normalizing flow and energy-based model, diffusion-based model. 
Okay, and first we will talk about the variational autoencoder. Uh, like we just said, oh, here we have a question. Um, um, yeah, this is a good question. Yeah, maybe it's kind of misleading. This, uh, this, uh, this thing should be placed here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that answers your question. Does it? But the, uh, about this arrow, um, so there might be other divergence. Uh, which is uh, not likelihood based. Yeah. So, yeah, there, there's a lot of other different variants about this model design. Yeah. Sorry about mistake. Uh, but, um, um, but the most well known in this model is the is, uh, Gentile adversary network, the guns, which proved to be the most uh, powerful and most efficient model, effective model we, we will use in most of the applications. Okay. So back to variational auto encoder. Directly, uh, we know that directly maximizing the likelihood, marginal likelihood is intractable due to this integral, right? Because we just showed that we are maximizing this. And when we plug this into this equation, um, we see that we will encounter a high dimensional integral. And this is a quite in, intractable. And unfortunately, it's not easy to compute the P of X in this way. Yeah, as it's often very expensive to track all the possible values of Z and then sum them up in a continuous version. You see that you have to track every every possible uh, value z take, and uh, time and uh, take the multiplication and sum all the possible uh, in the latent space. So this this is a not even not even possible. Are there any results showing that gun is the best way to optimize? Mm. Uh, why do we want to have a best way to optimize JSD? Because JSD is not the best divergence in modeling high dimensional data. So I, I don't think there's any point. Uh, so no one would like to spend time in investigating this problem. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, is that clear? Coincidental, mm, yeah, I think so. Yeah, uh, so you we stand from the point of, from the author's point of view, the first thing they think of is, uh, this a revolutionary treatment of player playing this two player game. And then later on, if you check the paper, they show that, I mean, in order for the paper to, to be published, they, they show some theoretical results uh, by showing it has some relation to the JS divergence. No statistical meaning. Uh, no, it, it has. Uh, it has the statistical meaning. So minimizing JS divergence. I mean, if you want to approximate one distribution to another distribution, you can pick any divergence you like. Uh, so, so when you take the JS divergence, this will give you one particular behavior. And there's no um, general uh, advantage of one divergence over the other. So it's always data dependent. It has to be analyzed case by case. Yeah, but there's, there, there must be some statistical divergence. It should be, yeah.
Um, the underlying assumptions. Um, so, so I think what you are asking is that uh, you want to have an intuitive uh, understanding of uh, what kind of be what's the difference between JSD and KL, right? Uh, yeah, there's a one paper maybe you are you you might be interested in it's called a note on on what uh, it's an ICLR paper. I couldn't remember the name. It's an ICLR paper, and then it's an analyze different uh, behavior. It show us the some plot, but but it's still in a low dimensional space. Like I said earlier on, uh, the general the conclusion you have for the lower dimensional space doesn't apply necessarily to high dimensional space. Yeah, it just gives you some intuition for the lower dimensional space. And yeah, maybe you can try. Uh, maybe I can Google it for you. Mm. <clears throat> Wait a second. Um, a note. Yeah, no time evaluation of journey models. Sorry, my connection is poor. And I can show you the uh, <clears throat> one image that is quite, uh, quite inspiring. So this is uh, the data, the true data we have, the toy data, which is the two Gaussians, a mixture of Gaussian action. So when you use KLD, okay, you use some uh, between P data and P theta, you can see the model actually converge at this place. You use one unimodal uh, density to approximate this uh, multimodal density then your model, what you get will, will be look like this, okay? And this is where you, you use a JSD, okay? You see that there is a different statistical behavior. So the, if you use JSD, this unimodal model will converge to the larger, model, larger modes instead of the smaller mode. So that's the difference. So KLD will tend to tend to uh, take care of uh, both of them. And uh, this will give you uh, some sort of a mean direction, mean distribution. But the uh, JSD will just, uh, will just uh, take the, the most important one, the most, uh, uh, the larger one that will account for a lower loss instead of a higher loss. Do you see what I mean here? Yeah, maybe you can understand it. But I like to say earlier on, um, this is just a toy data. So in high dimensional space, it doesn't hold always. It doesn't hold always. Yeah, this is just to help you understand the statistical behavior. Okay. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, we we'll continue with the discussion on um, yeah on very uh, on variation on sorry.
Is it possible? Yeah, it's possible, but uh, um, yeah, sure, it's possible. Like I said, we use a very restrictive model family. Yeah, we, we purposefully uh, use a very, um, I mean, uh, less powerful model distribution to approximate this hard case. Yeah, GML can do this, yeah. Yeah, this is just to show uh, the different uh, behavior we will have when using different kind of divergence. But the thing is, if you use a very powerful model to approximate this, this multi-model distribution, what you will have is that the KLD will and JSD will give you exactly this, maybe not exactly, but almost the same solution. You see that both of the modes can be covered. Yeah. And this doesn't lead you any, anywhere, right? So what you want to see is a difference between them. So we, we do this on purpose. <clears throat> okay. Mm. Oh, sorry. Yeah, you got the idea. Yeah. Okay. Uh, like I said, it's, it's impossible to check all the possible values of D. And to narrow down the value space and facilitate faster search, we would like to introduce a new approximation function profit, which is a likely code given X. So we incorporate another a new distribution called a Q parameterized by phi. You see that? It's, a, it's another neural network. It's defined by another neural, neural network that uh, approximate the posterior. So recall that the posterior is P of Z given X. So, <clears throat> so that's why we call it the approximate posterior. Okay. So we incorporate it. The reason why we incorporate it can be seen through the derivation like this. So recall that we, we are interested in the log of a P set of X. And this P set of X can be written in the integral and which is a very hard to compute, very hard to estimate. And we incorporate the Q here. We multiply this by Q and divide it by Q, which doesn't change the, in, the equality, right? <clears throat> and now we recognize it as a expectation over Q of a P, the conditional likelihood times prior divided by approximate posterior. This is a, a following the definition of expectation. And now we apply Jason inequality, which uh, where we reverse the uh, reverse the role of the position of log and expectation, which gave us the lower bound. Okay, so this will be lower bounded by <clears throat> the expectation of log of this. And now we, uh, we can factorize it into two form. So by definition, if you carefully derive it, you will see this, the first term is a, uh, uh, likelihood term. So where you draw some sample from the approximate post area and you uh, measure the conditional likelihood. And the second term is the KL divergence between the, the one you introduce and the prior you have. Yeah. So the idea is that this one is quite intractable. There's no way you can compute it and we resort to its lower bound to approximate it. So remember that we maximize this quantity. Uh, so we can't do this, but we can maximize its lower bound to, to approximate it, to, to value it. So that's uh, reasonable, right? Okay. So now we have the optimization objective. Okay, remember that we want to maximize it. And then we have to first, Further assume that this uh, post posterior. Um, oh, the variational, yeah, and that also involves a lot of theory behind this. 
So variational means that uh, you want, so in uh, basic calculus, we, you are interested in um, some object like a scalar matrix. And uh, so, so the function you are, you are considering is with regard to these, quanti these quantities like a scalar, like a vectors, right? But here, what we want to find is uh, some function. So one particular example is that, uh, I don't know whether you, you have ever heard of it. Uh, we have a, um, we have this, uh, and we have a ball here. Um, yeah, and a ball here. So we, if we throw a ball from here, we, let it go, and uh, we'll see it uh, uh, will going down to to the bottom, right? And uh, this line is a function we are interested in. We want to find the best function. So, so you can see that we are now not on, not we are now not in the interest in the uh, one big value. We are now considering a function. Uh, we want to find the best function that can can actually make things fast. Yeah, and maybe this will give us the best. Uh, you see what I mean? So this is uh, the so-called uh, the fattest uh, curve you will have. Yeah. So now you are, you are optimizing over a function. So back to our, our case, we want to find the distribution, the best distribution, which is not a scalar, not a vector. So this is called a variational optimization instead of a regular optimization. Yeah, do I make myself clear? Mm, yeah, okay. Yeah, and then we further assume that Q is uh, some Gaussian distribution where the mean is given by a function of uh, X and uh, sigma is also a function of X. And the prior we have is completely known. And this uh, conditional likelihood is also given by some, the function, the mean is given by some function of Z, but uh, varies. You can actually, uh, assume that uh, this variance is also a function of x, but here in most of cases, people would use just uh, identity matrix. Yeah, which is which means that x is uh, some nonlinear non function of z plus some epsilon, some noise from the constant noise. That these are two, these these are equivalent to one another. Yeah. So the reason why we have this assumption is that we can first uh, simplify these two terms, okay? So we have to take a digression that any two Gaussians, the KL divergence for any two Gaussians, the KL divergence between them has a falling closed form, can be written in this way, okay? So, so remember that we have the first uh, KL term so if we assume that uh, this is a Gaussian, then this is Gaussian, then we can further simplify it into this by applying these uh, results. Okay, and now uh, the, the first term, uh, if you just do some derivation, you will see that this is nothing but a reconstruction loss. That's why we have, that's why we call it autoencoder. Okay, you see there's a reconstruction loss from this, this conditional likelihood term, and uh, you retrieve the loss function for the autoencoder. But we don't call it an autoencoder because this is a problemat problematic, well, no, pro probabilistic, and, uh, and this is a variation, so we call it VE. Okay, now we have this loss function in analytic form. So we will take a look at its design. 
So the first thing uh, is the encoder, the variation encoder that takes the X as input and output is mean and covariance matrix. Okay, and then we draw some sample from this because we, we want to draw a, some Z from this Q, right? This encoder actually uh, characterizes this Q here. So we draw some sample from such a Gaussian distribution and put it into the decoder. The decoder is F, F of theta, right? So this will give us F of Z and we minimize the loss function. And in the meantime, we don't want this Q to fall too far apart from this, the prior. We have to regularize it to its prior. So we minimize the KL divergence between this Gaussian and the prior Gaussian, which has an analytic form. Is that clear? So this is architectural design. And then there's one thing, one caveat uh, we have to consider is that uh, this, this sampling procedure is not, uh, doesn't admit the back propagation in an end-to-end -end manner. So remember that uh, the most important thing in designing a uh, machine learning mechanism, a deep learning mechanism is that we have to ensure that the whole model can be trained end-to-end. But here, when you draw sam some sample from this Q distribution, you can't ensure that the loss can be propagated back to the encoder. This is fine, right? This is KL divergence is fine. You can ensure that it can be propagated back, propagated back to the encoder at the very beginning. But here, when you draw some sample, you actually cut, out, cut it out from the train rule, okay? But the clever design is that it is a so-called reparameterization trick. So the thing is that the key observation is that you draw, drawing from such a distribution is the equivalent to drawing, you first draw from the noise distribution, and then you apply this affine transformation that gives you Z. But these two things are, are equivalent, it's strictly equivalent. But the later one is quite smart. That allows for the uh, back propagation. You see that the, the computational graph doesn't break, doesn't broken from the yeah from the whole thing. Yeah, now you can see you draw something from this, and you apply the multiplication and you apply the addition, and this will give you f of t. Okay. Yeah, mm, and uh, remember that uh, these two functionality we have to consider is sampling and inexact infer uh, in inference, but here it's inexact uh, because um, there's no way you can find this log of P of X, right? Because it is, this is intractable as we mentioned before. So that's why we call it inexact inference. And as for sampling, uh, we just uh, throw away the, the encoder. And we just uh, draw some sample from the normal distribution and put it into the decoder. And this will give us image, the desired sample point. Yeah. And for the inference, uh, we need some uh, a mathematical calculation. So log of uh, P of X, remember we can, after introducing this Q, this can be written into the log of the expectation of this form, right? And then we have to uh, approximate this expectation by Monte Carlo. And you must be familiar with this because the expectation is usually approximated. When you can't take an integral, you will resort to the Monte Carlo approximation. You draw a bunch of uh, a lot of uh, samples from this distribution and you sum them up, you average the overall summation. Yeah, that's what we do here. You see that uh, this log of uh, P of X is approximated by the log of the average, the, uh, the so-called uh, uh, 
this, this so-called uh, uh, average of these whole samples, where Z is drawn from this Q here. And by, by making L large enough, this approximation becomes a better estimate of the marginal likelihood. And in fact, since this is a multicolor estimator, and this, in theory, this kind of converges to the actual marginal likelihood. Yeah. So that's why we call it the inexact inference. And later on, we also add a model that can allow us for doing this exact inference. Okay, and uh, yeah, so, so in summary, we can uh, say that uh, if the inference is inexact, because we are maximizing the lower bound of the likelihood, everything is inexact in variation of autoencoder. So this will lead us to, yeah, the likelihood-based model will lead us to variation of autoencoder. Okay. Yeah, and then for the next 20 minutes, we will take a look at some implementation about the variation of autoencoder. <clears throat> Here I will show you um, yeah, we on the toy data set. <clears throat> uh, why is it not the a W E. What, what's A W E? Is uh, taking the expectation from it. Oh, why is not the case with taking the expectation from the distribution defined by? Um. expectation defined by phi. Okay, uh, I see what you mean here. Um, so to optimize such a model, you you need to find an analytic loss function, right? So this doesn't give you a loss, uh, a good loss in analytic form when you take an integral strictly, but uh, you can actually draw sample from Q. Uh, when you can draw some sample, but you don't have a specific form for this P of X, but you can draw sample from Q here, right? And this Q here can actually give you the Monte Carlo estimator. Uh, maybe you are asking why we don't do this in the training phase. Is that what you're asking? So the, the reason why we don't do this is because uh, Every time you have to draw a larger bunch of samples and these samples without training the model is quite unstable. It's a, the, I mean, the, uh, the variance of this estimate is really large. So you, you can't have a stable training process. Um, but we can do this during inference, okay? Because during inference, you, you only do it once and that's done. P theta Z. P, P theta Z is a prior, is a completely known. So there's no, there's no unknown parameter for this prior. So, so uh, there's nothing to worry about. Two slides back. This one? This one? Oh, yeah. Uh, sorry, can, maybe, I, maybe I ask uh, with the voice. So if you go back yeah. to one, uh, maybe it's like 40? So 40, yeah. <clears throat> uh, so so you, uh, uh, maybe one more, one more. One more. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah you said like that uh, it's uh, not possible to, take the 
to compute this this expectation of p theta z p theta x you said it's not possible so you're using the q phi to approximate p theta z x yeah so so why why don't you just sample from take the monte carlo approximation from p theta z x instead of defining a new approximation because p theta zx is already an approximation to to the distribution of x no so you're trying mm, to yeah. so you're trying to like uh, approximate the distribution of x with the distribution z uh no that um, has parameters so yeah, so, why the, so, so why don't you just yeah so the, you're asking why don't we just uh, draw a sample from z during the training process right yeah yeah, why don't yeah we, like why, just why do the monte try... carlo on there on this, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, this means that you don't have an encoder, right? Uh, okay. So you, uh, all you got to do is, difference? yeah, you, you only, so if you, you do it, do it your way, then you only, you, you have only the decoder here and you draw some sample from this and you calculate the conditional likelihood and you plug it into the loss function. Uh, sorry. Uh, here you plug it into this, right? And do the calculation, do the summation, and uh, mm -hmm. then you perform the loss uh, back propagation. Is that what you're asking? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think yeah, so, like, has... yeah, but basically, yeah, like I didn't really understand that why you need the function, uh, the approximation Q phi. Because okay. uh, because like okay. it seems like you're doing two approximations, uh, one with the distribution that's parameterized by phi, and then the other parameterized by theta. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so for the first two question is that why don't we use this? Uh, because um, like I said, this is a you have to draw a lot of sample during the pro during the training process, and uh, at the initial phase, your model is perform really poorly and you can't expect this will give you a reasonable you know the reasonable sample yeah so first is a uh, very expensive then next is a uh, very you know problematic and then uh, uh, regarding the second question why we don't why we have this is because we want to do inference because having this decoder alone you don't you can't do inference you know? In inference, mm -hmm. we want to estimate the latent given x, right? You don't have such a mm -hmm. procedure for it. But uh, with Q here, we can actually uh, do this. You see that? Uh, yeah. Uh, OK, yeah. No, it's yeah. just that, uh, but you're saying that it's, it, it's, it, it's uh, not difficult to sample from Q then. Uh, so so, it's, mm -hmm. uh, so how, why is it the case? Oh, Q is... because because Q is a no, normal distribution. When we when you have ah, okay. a mean, yeah, it's completely determined. Then. Ah, okay. Yeah. But then the 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 distribution uh, given by P by P theta, it's it can be something else, something you don't know. Uh, you mean P theta Z or P theta yeah. X? Too? Yeah, P theta Z, uh, P theta oh. Z. Yeah, yeah. Is well, that P theta some... Z? It, it can. It can have some learnable parameter, but the people in most cases they just uh, uh, assume it is completely known. Yeah. Known. Uh, yeah, known. So, so, yeah. so, 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 if you know this distribution, uh, you're saying that it's expensive to sample from it. Uh, um, no, no, so, it's not. Because um, then you could also, because like yeah, you could also do the Monte Carlo, but then you're saying that uh, that. That is not a good idea because you didn't. You, you it's better to encode x first and then sample for another distribution, q phi. Oh yeah, yeah, right. Um, so this is expensive, not because, uh, not because this, not because drawing a sample from this pz, but because uh, you have to draw a lot of sample to make sure that you have to do this every time you you perform the you you do the iteration you see what i mean 
Mm. You okay. have to do this lots of times during training. Uh, okay. But you do one time for inference, just one time. Okay. Yeah. For yeah, for the uh, for the Q, for you one, only do one, once. What for when you draw in from Q, you only do once. You saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. I see. Thanks, then. Yeah, yeah. No problem. Yeah. Um, is it because the QU can run the next? Yes. Yeah. QU. You you mean QZ given X, right? Oh, sorry, I, I just, you, the U is just you. Oh, oh, sorry, uh, because you can learn Z. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Q can, uh, the reason why we incorporate Q lies in twofold. One is that it can make us, make it possible for us to inference something, to infer the latent. Another uh, one 